afternoon. Um, welcome to this afternoon's um, lecture, which is a collaboration between Polytalk um, and the Center for Global Development here at UFB. Uh, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that UFB is situated here in traditional tutorial territories. And here in Abbasford, I would like to particularly acknowledge and pay respect to the Sumas, the Maspi, and Public Affairs Nations, our closest uh, neighbors. My name is Edward Akufo, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Political Science, and I'm also the head of the department. I would like to tell you just a brief thing about you know, Polytalk, you know, round, uh, Polytalk you know, uh, platform. Now, I founded this Polytalk you know, platform in 2015 when I first became the head of the Department of Political Science. And today we are very happy as a department you know, to collaborate with the Center for Global Development for this afternoon's uh, lecture. We also want to thank the College of Arts and the Office of Research, Engagement and Graduate Studies for sponsoring this afternoon's event. Now, the Polytalk platform is for engaging on topical you know, issues and pushing the boundaries of ideas and creating public awareness and sustaining active minds that are conscious of political, cultural, Social and social economic you know, issues in our community here in Abbasford and the Fraser Valley, and at the federal level and at the world you know, at large. Now, we hope that you will engage and be challenged this afternoon to think more deeply about the world that we live in. Now, before the uh, our guests lecturer, um, the speaker, you know, come up here to deliver the lecture, you know, to us, I would like to introduce the president and vice president of UFB, Dr. Juan McLean, to give the opening, you know, remarks. Now, you know, Dr. Juan McLean, McLean as a president and, you know, um, vice chancellor, I need to do a good job of introducing you well, so please, um, I don't want to be in trouble if you do that. <laughs> so please, uh, bear with me. Dr. John McLean was appointed President and Vice Chancellor of the University of the Fraser Valley on May 1st, 2018, and was reappointed for a second term ending June 30th, 2028. Dr. McLean is dedicated to leading UFB in its mission of engaging learners, transforming lives, and building community, and ensuring UFB's endeavors are guided by its values, strategic directions, and commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. As an institution situated on the Stolo Tomac um, territory, here, uh, the traditional territory of the Stolo Inu you know, people, UMB acknowledges the contributions that indigenous people are making and continue to make to our community. Dr. McLean is committed to moving UMB forward in reconciliation and to supporting indigenous learners and honoring indigenous ways of knowing. Prior to joining UMB in 2012, as Dean of the College, Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Dr. McLean held appointments at the University of Windsor and Brock University. I was at Brock University. She received a PhD from Ohio State University where she studied human resource management in sports and recreation and administration in higher education. She holds a bachelor and a master degree from the University of New Brunswick in her hometown of Fredericton. Dr. McLean is the author of two books and was 70 peer-reviewed publications and presentations. She was named a research fellow of the North American Society for Sports Management in 2009. One fun fact that I know about Dr. McLean is that 
she go for what in the evenings with her dogs. And I love seeing those dogs. Dr. McKay, please watch. Please let's watch. Everyone, it is uh, it is so good to be here this afternoon. Good afternoon uh, and welcome. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Akufo. Thank you, thank you for that warm, generous introduction. An unneeded, generous introduction. Thank you, though. It's a pleasure to be here. This is an important event, and, and I welcome all of you here to UFB. Um, our students, members of faculty, administration, members of our community. We're very glad that you're here. Um, and especially I welcome uh, Dr. Andy Knight, who is, uh, of course, our esteemed speaker today. He is a political scientist, a distinguished professor, and we're so glad to have him here. Um, I do want to uh, acknowledge we're on the beautiful territory of the Hakamelan speaking Stalo people, uh, the people of the river, and to express my gratitude for the fact that our, our beautiful campuses across the Fraser Valley are on Stalo lands, people who who have, uh, have resided here and stewarded these lands for, for millennia, and we are uh, so thankful for that. So today's lecture is a, a special opportunity for all of us at UFB, and again, I'm so glad that everyone has made time to be here. We welcome an esteemed scholar and Professor Knight, uh, an individual pioneering uh, new knowledge and truth through his passion for politics and a quest for social justice, uh, for equality and equity around the world. And you're going to learn more uh, about his trailblazing career from Dr. Kufo in a moment, I believe. But permit me to just add uh, a personal welcome uh, and, and gratitude to you, uh, Professor Knight, for, for coming to UFE, for traveling uh, this way to British Columbia, for taking time yesterday to meet with me, uh, which I treasured, even though it was a, a, sh a short window, a small window of time. Uh, we're all looking forward to your lecture. So Professor Knight's scholarship is of critical importance to all of us. Uh, you see, his work transcends uh, membership at the table of respected worldwide scholars at which he has earned a place for his work to a role with policymakers at the highest levels of world government uh, and those who are seeking to reassess global governance uh, at a time of conflict, at a time of war, at a time of turmoil and, and attacks against democracy. Concern with where political systems are headed with the reassessment of global governance is well founded. In today's world, we're experiencing more change, more disruption, more upheaval uh, than has been experienced in most of our lifetimes. And political and cultural conflict, growing inequities that are abounding, unprecedented change in the world of work and in work migration climate change and a rapid decrease in the health of our planet and those living across the planet, uh, and an unprecedented reliance on technologies are contributing, I think, to an environment of constant change and of significant uncertainty. And we are rightfully concerned about the future, for the health and well-being of this generation, but also the next generation and the generation after that. And I believe that collectively, we can change course, we can learn and listen, we can engage and ensure we pass on a world that is better tomorrow than today, one that is a future full of promise uh, and potential for generations to come. But there is work to be done. And today's lecture is, is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to listen, to learn, to acknowledge our privileges so that we may recognize our own responsibilities and consider ways in which we can contribute to necessary change. Our role as a university is to bring together learners and leaders and seekers into this gathering place that is this campus, such that we can create an understanding and contribute to the social good, be part of the global pursuit of truth, and even recognize and face those inconvenient truths. Universities across the world stand for truth. The pursuit of truth also requires courage, and those who seek to shift the paradigm 
have often initially been met with challenge and sometimes ridicule. We see that across history. They have absolutely been required to defend their ideas, to debate and marshal evidence in support of theories, and often to defend ideas against political attack. Universities are places where transformational thought and action occur and where we nurture ideas and further understanding. And that's what we're here to do today. Today's lecture, Professor Andy Knight, is going to help us to think through and to do some of just that as students, as scholars, as members of the communities in which we exist and we serve, and as members of the global community. This is an important opportunity for us to listen and learn, but to embrace the difficult task of being quick to understand, but slow to judge and to consider how we might address the racial biases and inequities that exist at home and across the world. I encourage each of us uh, today and, and, and tomorrow and beyond to apply a critical lens to the realities of the narratives and the media that we consume, to action our commitment to building a community that is of ethical and engaged local and global citizens. This will require us to learn, to unlearn, to reflect and to take action, for we cannot redress current and historical injustices and aspire for peace without doing so. We simply cannot. There is much work to be done across the world and right home here in the Fraser Valley and here at home our ongoing work to rebuild relationships with indigenous people, to acknowledge our history of colonial justice, uh, injustices and violence, discrimination and racism and to build a brighter future uh, for everyone is, is fundamental to who we are, to what we can do, to the impact we can have. And we're fortunate today to have Professor Knight with us to expand our knowledge and understanding of the shifts happening in that global context. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank all of you for being here, for engaging the role that we can all importantly play. And I also want to recognize uh, Dr. Edward Kufo and his colleagues in political science and the Center for Global Development and those who are part of PolyTalks uh, for their leadership, for their scholarship, uh, for hosting the series, for hosting Dr. Knight today, and for enabling each of us uh, to engage UFE's aspiration of the Ekutu, which is to be a house of transformation uh, locally and, and beyond. So thank you all. Now, before I introduce um, our guest speaker for today, I would like to say that um, after this lecture, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions and to make you know, comments. So, um, if you have questions, please note them down and you will be happy to take all of the questions. Now, I'm very honored you know, to introduce Professor Roberto and Knight, the speaker for this afternoon's you know, lecture. Gabriel and Knight is a professor of international relations in the political science department at the University of Alberta and past chair of the department. He is former director of the Institute of International Relations the University, at the University of West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago, and co-founder and former head of the Diplomatic Academy of the Caribbean. Of the Caribbean. He is co-editor in chief of African Security Journal and editor in chief of International Journal all globally prestigious peer-reviewed publications. And he is established, and he is established during his second secondment in the Caribbean, the Caribbean General of International Relations and Diplomacy. Professor Knight was co-editor of another highly regarded and award-winning journal, Global Governance, from 2000 to 2000. And five, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Professor Knight was named by Venture Magazine among Alberta's top 50 most influential people, and by the Black Business and Professional Association of Canada, the Harry 
Jerome Trailblazer. He served as advisory board member of the World Economic Forum, Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Welfare of Children, and was director of the Peace and post conflict Studies Certificate Program in the Office of Interdisciplinary Studies at the University of Alberta. In March 2007, Dr. Knight was appointed by the Canadian Foreign Minister to the Board of Governors of International Development Research Centre and served in that position until 2011. Knight has written several books on the United Nations, Global Politics, Building Sustainable Peace, Remapping the Americas, and Responsibility to Protect. One of his most recent published books is the award-winning Female Suicide Bombings, The Critical Gendered Approach, with Tanya Lorenza, um, which is, was published by the University of Toronto Press. His ongoing research and publications address issues of global health governance, global health security, children and war, the vulnerabilities and resilience of small island developing states, and changes in the world order. In March 2001, Professor Knight was awarded the University of Alberta's highest honor, the University of Alberta Distinguished Professor. In June 2021, he was named the 2021-2022 Fulbright Distinguished Chair in International and Area Studies at Yale University. He has just completed his Fulbright at Yale. Now, two fun facts about Professor Knight. Now, aside from his many academic you know, accomplishments, which I have invested, he is an outstanding artist. You need to see some of his artworks. <coughs> and the number two thing relates to me. And um, another colleague in the room, Dr. Megan McKenzie, who is a professor and director of the International Studies Program at Simon Fraser University. We had you know, the privilege of being his students, and also he was you know, the, uh, the PhD advisor of um, Dr. McKenzie, and I have the honor of him serving on the advisory committee by PhD Dr. Knight. Welcome to UAB and your audience is ready to hear from Thank you very much, Edward, and um, what a pleasure it is to come all the way to BC to, for the very first time, come to Amherstburg and to see your wonderful university and to be good friends. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam President, President, for your kind introduction to my work. I almost feel as though you set a contest for me, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> um, but. Um, so wonderful to see Dr. McKenzie and Dr. Kufo, um, both of my students. Uh, I, I, I know Dr. Kufo mentioned the Children on War project, uh, and it could not have been a success without Dr. McKenzie, who did some fabulous work on the ground in Sierra Leone. Um, when I was working on children who set up by war, child soldiers, it was a very difficult time. I remember that time, but she made it through and was able to do a very, very good segment of the research for me. And uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. I'm glad that we are here in person and not just online. <laughs> I spent the last two and a half years mostly doing my lectures online, so it's good to see you in person. Today, I'm looking at a very interesting subject, uh, the interregnum. 
and leadership in world order. And I know that uh, that word interregnum, you're probably wondering, what does that mean? Uh, someone said to me today, that was a person that came to her mind when she saw the term interregnum. What does what interregnum really mean? Is this a special political science term? Uh, it's really a historical term that's been used for a very long time uh, to talk about the shifts that occur, the, the period, the space of time between one world order and the next. And I think I'm really living through that space of time right now, where it is a sh shift, a transformation, almost a shifting of tectonic plates uh, in world order right now. And that means that, uh, you know, we're living in a time of flux and turbulence, and we see this happening almost every day. And I wanted to show you something. I don't know if you can get this to work here for me. Uh, maybe I could beat your um, Edward's help. Um, but I wanted to show you the that small thing. Um, something that's happening as we speak. We're not in Russia, of all places. Uh, this is a small clip of what's happening in Russia today. Now, that's, that's actually happening in Russia, in the streets of Moscow. People are actually um, uh, protesting the war in Ukraine. And we know that this is uh, very unusual in the dictatorial Russian state to have people come out and take the risk of, of protesting um, what's going on in Ukraine. But that's what's happening. And I could show you another clip of a major transformation is happening in Pakistan right now in terms of the topography of Pakistan because of uh, the, 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 the large um, flooding that's happening there. And people are, are losing lives uh, and property. And I know that Abbotsford is going through some of this as well. So you know that climate change is a reality. And as my former Prime Minister of Barbados, I, I used to live in Barbados, so I call her the Prime Minister of Barbados. Uh, uh, Mia Mondi has said recently, uh, we have to stop using the term climate change and talk about climate crisis because that's the reality that we face right now. We're in a climate crisis. And this climate crisis is causing us to think very seriously about how we govern uh, the world. The need for resilient structures that need to be put in place in order to protect individuals uh, from disaster because of the climate. Um, and the need to sort of get away from fossil fuel, fuels and, and, and sort of use non-renewable um, sources of energy in order to be able to, uh, to advance our society and, um, and, and save ourselves from this kind of crisis that we're in. Now for scholars and observers of international relations who've been following geopolitical and socioeconomic trends, particularly since the end of the Cold War, our world appears to be ungovernable. The post-Cold War period has been marked, I think, by an intensification of globalization with all its attendant negative effects and by deglobalization as this sort of inevitable counter response to hyperglobalization that exists. This period is also characterized as an era of ushering in a new world disorder. I think, and yet we have institutions created since 1945, institutions of governance, of global governance, like the United Nations system, that are supposed to manage, that are supposed to address the global problems that we are facing today, and to steer us into a future that's more peaceful, more just, more stable, more sustainable, and more prosperous. You just have to look at the targets of the 2015 Millennium Development Goals and the concomitant 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and it's the 169 targets to see the normative desire that is in place uh, for strengthening global solidarity on the part of member states of the United Nations to 
establish some semblance of global governance by institutions and agencies of this 27 year, sorry, 77 year old organization. I am arguing here in this presentation that the extant institutions of global governance, including but not limited to the United Nations system, are more or less decisions frozen in time. Their decisions from the time they, because they were created at a historical juncture when sovereignty bound entities reigned supreme, the nation state as a sovereignty bound entity. Today, those institutions are being forced to operate in a turbulent, what they call complex, interdependent, and interdomestic era. An era in which sovereignty free and sovereignty bound actors are forced to jog, to jostle, and compete for position on the global stage. And under the uh, ellipsoidal glare and intensity of the spotlight at this critical moment in our history, <coughs> post World War II institutions like the United Nations are revealing themselves to be severely defective, ineffective, inefficient, and largely irrelevant. So this creates what's called a crisis of global governance at this moment in our history. And it's been triggered in large part by an intense and growing interest in the issue of governance at all levels. This is not a time to be having a knee-jerk reaction to what's going on, or what I call a reflexive moment. It's time for silent reflection and contemplation. It's a time for us to reconceptualize what global governance actually means in the 21st century, or the 21st century. It's a propitious moment for constructing a new global governance paradigm. And that's what I'm trying to do with my research at Yale uh, on the Fulbright. Uh, to assist us in this sort of introspective exercise, we may need to shift from problem solving type of theorizing to embrace a critical theory approach that stands outside the prevailing understandings of what global governance has come to mean. And in Gramscian terms, and Robert Cox is one of the, the Gramscian scholars um, who said this as well, this would require an empirical examination of the patchwork concoction that we have labeled as global governance today. For us to see clearly, and this is described accurately, uh, the post-Cold War political fragmentative and complex interdependent environment within which the architecture is being constructed, the architecture of global governance is being constructed. Such an exercise, I think, is important at this stage. If our normative goal is to ensure that the, the extant multilateral institutions, like the United Nations system, are truly fit for purpose. And to be fit for purpose means that we have to be relevant to the rapidly changing conditions that exist around us. In conceptual, conception of, uh, in practical terms, being fit for purpose may require what I call a Kuhnian paradigm shift from a reformist and adaptive strategies to those of transformation and reconceptualization of the very great reason that of what global governance functions are all about. And in the absence of world government, I think this is very important at this critical stage in our history. Now to the interregnum. I mean, I my sort of shift to the interregnum. Um, here we are. I raise some questions that we should ask ourselves at this particular crucial moment. Global politics in the early part of the 21st century has been dominated by some gruesome acts of rampant terrorism, multilateral and unilateral reprisals for those acts of terrorism, global downturns, hyper-globalization, deglobalization, mountain strife, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And this is a turbulent time that reveals cracks if not a total breakdown in the prevailing global order, and has held and led us to, to shout out and demand uh, 
the, the establishment of new institutions of global governance to replace the, 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 the war existing ones that exist. This is not the first time in world history that we've had prevailing systems of governance being challenged by pronounced structural forces for change. Over centuries, we've had repeated attempts at reforming existing international institutions, at creating new ones, at attaining the conflicts and disorders of, of those periods. And more recently, during the intermediate, uh, the, the immediate post-Cold War period, we witnessed the removal of some of the structural and ideological independence of superpower, superpower conflicts, conflicts between the US and the USSR. And that characterized the last uh, uh, previous um, century. Apart from relaxing global tensions, this changed structural condition ostensibly reduced the major security threat that the world faced at that time and during the Cold War. That is the, the threat of nuclear war between two heavily armed military camps that could have resulted in what we like to call mutual assured destruction or MAD. By the end of that precarious balance of power period between the two superpowers, the end of something around 1989, 1990, um, created a climate of uncertainty, the rise in civil conflicts, the spread of internecine violence in places like Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, Rwanda, in Somalia, in Sudan, and the former Yugoslavia. In the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, there have been approximately 93 conflicts around the world in which over 5.5 million people were killed, 75% of them civilians. Almost all of these conflicts were intra-state conflicts, as opposed to interstate conflicts, and this explains the disproportionate number of civilians uh, that died or remained as a result of this conflict. Now, this immediate post-Cold War period was also characterized by an exponential increase in transnational challenges. Some of these challenges included the horizontal proliferation of weapons, weapons of mass destruction, small arms and light weapons, and illicit trade with small arms and light weapons in particular, the spread of hate material, ideologies of hate, the increased consumption of pornography and sexual slavery, computer hack hacking, cyber theft, uh, cyber warfare, and increasing drug trafficking, um, trafficking of women and children, and an increase in mass migration and a number of internally displaced persons. Forced labor, organized criminal activity, financial market collapses, piracy on the high seas, and we did a, a project um, about piracy in the Horn of Africa uh, that was funded by the Qatar government because of their interest in what was going on in the, in the high seas off the coast of Malacca Straits and also off the coast of Somalia and Nigeria and circumvention of national regulatory policies and, and taxes, etc. Now, certainly the national institutions that are supposed to express people's preferences on these matters and increase uh, the, the, the effectiveness of coping with them, many of these national institutions are not able to do so. Um, and, uh, and the post-World War, War II institutions of, of governance that were designed to address the interstate issues were suddenly showing signs at the end of the Cold War, not only of inefficiency and ineffectiveness, as I said before, but also, quite frankly, of irrelevance. In addition, many of the, the regional institutions do not fare any better. So you have institutions like the European Union, uh, CARICOM, ASEAN, African, African Union. Many of the regional organizations were supposed to be stopping gap measures to, to deal with these problems, and they haven't fared much better. And this raised an alert among most international politics observers and scholars and practitioners of the need for a new global governance architecture that would eventually and effectively deal with transnational and domestic uh, issues. Um, the debacle in Somalia, which you all remember, the Rwandan genocide, 
At times, an indiscriminate, politically motivated slaughter in the Democratic Republic of Congo that you've all read about, I think. Um, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Mozambique, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the continued violence in other places in, in the Middle East, um, in Asia, in Chechnya, uh, in Latin America, now in Myanmar, Sri Lanka, the list goes on and on. They all indicate a persistent adherence to a culture of violence as hypernationalism, terrorism, and long suppressed ethnic conflicts rear their ugly heads in the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Now, other human tragedies, gross human rights violations, um, have occurred in so called failed states, where the degeneration or the total absence of national governance and national government structures has meant that civilians were particularly vulnerable to concatenated violence and, and at times a random acts of violence, such as kidnappings, murders, internally displaced persons, etc. Houses of children were and continue to be recruited as shot soldiers both by government and rebel forces, as Dr. Mackenzie knows very well. Um, you know, and this continues to today. The destruction of national infrastructures and governmental and societal and institutions worth billions of dollars was due at times to internecine violence, but also um, at other times to natural and man-made disasters, tsunamis, hurricanes, uh, floods, uh, during this immediate post-Cold War period. Again, national governments found it very difficult to address these problems and the spillover effects of these problems. Um, sometimes spillover effects uh, associated with internal conflicts and human humanitarian disasters. Similarly, international governmental organizations like the United Nations, regional intergovernmental bodies like the African Union have all struggled to cope with the increasingly transnational and intermestic nature of the problem. And by intermestic, what I mean is that this sort of this dividing line that we normally have between the external and the internal is so is now is now so blurred that the, the governance of both things have to be reconsidered in an intermestic setting. Uh, in general, the narrative I painted just now is 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 quick uh, is a quick sort of panoramic scan of what can only be described as a new world disorder. An environment of turbulence, of flux, of fragmentation, of disequilibrium, of uncertainty, that cries out for the establishment of novel forms of governance. Novel forms of government processes, novel forms of government institutions, since the existing ones are woefully inadequate and woefully ineffective. But this picture is only sort of one part of the puzzle of this interregnum. The interregnum also um, is features, is features a, a, an integrative and fragmentary set of forces. I call it fragmentation. Um, James Rosno actually used that term first when he talked about fragmentation as meaning that there are forces of fragmentation, of forces of integration almost acting at the same time. And that tension of private relations is what's causing us to think very seriously about the nature of governance uh, of that kind of uh, situation. James Rosnow also alerted us to some of the ways in which the advent of dynamic technologies has resulted in the decline of distances in the modern world. He called it distance uh, proximities. Uh, technological advances in communications and transportation have resulted in an increase in the complex uh, interdependence of the group. Um, for those political scientists who follow this kind of thinking, you have, just have to go to Robert Cohen and Joseph Nye uh, to read their book in 1977, which raised this issue of complex interdependence. Modern communications, uh, via newspapers and radios, television, telephones, fax, machines, computers, the internet, social media, emails, etc., appear to be producing contradictory outcomes. 
on the one hand uniting, but on the other hand fragmenting audiences, um, on the one hand exacerbating social privileges, as well as bringing about disparate groups uh, together, bringing them together, uh, sometimes heightening existing antagonisms, as well as providing means through which such frictions can be resolved. Sometimes eroding national boundaries, as well as propelling ultra-nationalist fervor, increasing political cynicism, as well as raising the level of civil society's political consciousness. So you see the, the, the double movement that's happening uh, because of communication technologies. Um, and this makes it very much more difficult to govern during that kind of period. There's no question that individual citizens have been empowered because of the, the rise in the, in the uh, and advances in modern technology. Um, but at the same time, because of their adeptness at dealing with modern communication systems, state leaders and powerful elites have also been empowered vis-a-vis -vis civil society. So modern transportation has allowed people of formerly distant places uh, to interact more frequently with people uh, over here. It has also act as a conduit for bringing individuals of different countries with similar interests together. But it's also served to facilitate transnational criminal activity. It served to exacerbate, in some cases, social privileges. So the overall effect of what I've described here um, has also been described by James Camilleri and Jim Falk as a shrinkage in social, political, economic, and cultural distances because of this shrinkage, because of this phenomenon, uh, formerly dense and opaque frontiers are being dissolved. That's breaking down the Westphalian notion of inside versus outside. This container concept that we said that we use in political science to describe what's going on. Uh, national boundaries are no longer able to, to separate friend from foe, despite Donald Trump's attempt to build a wall. Um, but the technological revolution is also potentially created in the minds of many people around the world, a sense of global citizenship, which could result eventually in the transfer of individual loyalties from sovereignty bound, the nation state, to sovereignty free, government's bodies. And this changing relationship between public and private spheres and the virtual collapse of the dividing line that separates the domestic from the external environment suggests a fluidity um, that said uh, that's new integrated global system has produced and a notion of a fragmented system of nationally demilated, demilated uh, sovereign entities is no longer tenable. However, this does not mean that the global society, global civil society is informed or that the nation state is going to wear it anytime soon. I think one can argue that the nation state is still here and you can see this in its attempts to sort of react against uh, the growth of the global civil society, uh, to react against some of these attempts to, to break down the, um, the, the power that state and nation states normally have. But one thing I can say is that the, the, the technological revolution, globalization, etc., has contributed to global space and time shrinkage. And it's also the globalization of trade, production, and finance has resulted in a marked decline in many governments' ability to control those sectors. So there's a kind of a, I would call it a, um, uh, a diminishing power of the nation state as a result of these forces. And it's opened the door for other actors besides nation states to fill that void. And, and therefore, the diminishing of power of the nation state requires us to think seriously about uh, any sort of global, global governance mechanism that uh, used to be controlled by the nation state. Um, there are other ways in which globalization has facilitated the dissolution um, of formerly dense and opaque borders. For instance, economic globalization has resulted in a global division of labor that hardly respects state boundaries and sovereignty. It, is, it has, to a large extent, been responsible for the feminization of work, particularly in the developing world. This penetrates traditional gender boundaries. The international movement of capital via 
uh, electronic transfers has also, ha has also had major effects on the reallocation of the party and party structures. And similarly, media globalization um, through satellite networks like CNN, MSNBC, BBC, Al Jazeera, the International the Internet Superhighway has contributed to the diffusion of power. Its impact raises the possibility of the development of a truly global civil society, something that we could not imagine maybe a few years ago. And but it could transform the nature of multilateralism, it could transform the way we view governance today. At the same time, global media ownership is becoming so concentrated in the hands of a few wealthy individuals, powerful individuals, and conglomerates, that the end result is a reduced competition and increased harmonization, homogenization of content. I think what is clear from that overview I've given um, really shows that there is a clash between complex interdependence and globalization phenomena on the one hand and isolationist dis and disentanglement forces on the other. And this is challenging international governance as we know it today and raises the possibility of the emergence of other forms of governance at a global level adequately to adequately address transnational and domestic issues and problems that we face. Now, what I want to do is, is move on to uh, the kind of governance that we have today and how that can be transformed. Now, since, as you know, since 1945, we've had um, the creations of the United Nations system as a global form of government. Um, but, in, but we've had, in the past, uh, a whole different type of government system, um, from empires to balance of power arrangements, to plurilateral and transversal bodies, to formal and informal limited purpose intergovernmental organizations, uh, to formal and informal multipurpose international organizations, to regional intergovernmental organizations, transregional organizations, transnational non-governmental organizations, and regimes. Uh, today we have what I would call summative governance as a paradigm, a new paradigm, with multi-level global governance. Um, I think Amitabh Acharya talks about this in terms of, um, of multiplex global governance. Everything about the multiplex theater. Um, where you can go in and watch a, television, a, a movie uh, in one theater, while others are watching movies in another theater. This sort of idea of a multiplex government system uh, explains to him uh, the direction in which we have come. This sort of summative global governance, as they call it. There are transnational corporations, business associations, public and private consortia, um, moderating agencies, transnational social, social movements, transnational advocacy networks, epistemic communities, transpersonal plurilateral organizations, coalitions of the willing. Coalitions of non governmental organizations, formerly and former regimes, terrorist organizations as well, and security communities. This to me sums up in large part what I would call a summative global governance picture. And it's within that context that we have to start to think about global governance architecture uh, being transformed into something else than what we've been used to. And that's where I'm going to end my lecture today. The recent interest in multi-level governance, multi-level global governance, in large part from its recognition of the, the, the scale of global change, the shrinkage of time and space in the sort of last 70 years, the emergence of transnational civil society, the rising interdependence among actors, state and non-state, within inter international society, the rise in the number of complexity of transnational and domestic societies, the rise in the number of uh, issues that have been addressed by the United Nations system and other organizations, and the failure and inability sometimes to address those issues. All these things provide common goods and security guarantees for citizens uh, are in jeopardy, um, particularly since the end of World War II. We've witnessed at least three different challenges to traditional Westphalian international governance systems as represented in the institutional and United Nations system. First, the technological revolution has made it possible for many actors other than states to 
enter on the world stage and to demand a role in the decision making at that level. Secondly, the intensification of globalization has altered the relationship between citizens at the state and international organizations. Uh, globalization has facilitated greater participation of non-state actors in government processes normally reserved for states. But because globalization is, is a double-edged sword, it has also made it easier for transnational criminal organizations and terrorist organizations to command the attention of government's bodies at all levels. It has also widened the gap between the rich and the poor, thereby increasing the challenges of intergovernmental bodies. And thirdly, the end of the Cold War can be seen as a historical turning point for intergovernmental institutions. It has resulted in the exponential expansion in the scope and the agenda of international governmental organizations. So much so that these organizations are having to contract out their work to other organizations and services. Um, all three of these challenges, I think, has created new problems for governance and ensures that even more actors ought to be involved in the managing of these problems. I was seven students today of, a, of an example at the United Nations. The Canadian delegation goes to the United Nations, the General Assembly, and you see in the back of their British really sitting at the table. And they always have a Canadian sign there, Canada sign there, and, and the, the representative, the permanent representative of the United Nations in the front, and then there are a whole bunch of people on the back. Okay? Some of those individuals are not state actors. Some of those individuals are, in some cases, environmental activists, um, global health experts, people with this particular um, niche of understandings of how things should operate, and they're able to advise the firm member how to, what to say in, the, in their presentations. This shows to me that there is a, a, a kind of a shift happening in how we um, present uh, in the, the United Nations as a, as a state-based organization. It's no longer a state-based organization from that point of view. And one of the other things I want to mention as we kind of wrap up here is that there are some people, <coughs> scholars, who are looking at this problem of governance today and trying to sort of come up with a normative view uh, of how we can transform global governance. One of those um, was Robert Cox, who um, of course recently passed away. And Robert Cox, though, through his multilateralism and United Nations system research project that began in 1992, I was a student at the time uh, at the beginning of that project. And by the time it was finished, I was a professor at the University of Alberta. But because of the MUNS program, the multilateralism and United Nations system program, uh, there's been an attempt made by scholars to understand the long-term structural changes that are necessary, uh, the, the, the need for transformation of the United Nations system rather than tinkering and reforming the organization. And uh, there's an less explicit goal of considering a future new multilateral project built from the bottom up. That's very different from most of the governing organizations that we've created. They're mostly being top down. Uh, so there's this idea that we should be building from the bottom up. The bottom of multilateralism is conceived as organic and network based with discourse mechanisms as well as democratic structures to ensure accountability to the world's peoples. At the same time, the multilateralism and United Nations system researchers have begun to realize that the constraints imposed by the more powerful on the text of uh, uh, of a less part of the play and greater role in the global governments uh, must cease. In other words, we should in include at the table of the special making uh, those less part of the marginalized. And that, I think this is one of the, the directions in which we're going to go in the future. Finally, um, we have to look at the, the summative nature of global governance and try to understand how the principles and the norms and the rules and the practices and decision-making procedures are shifting as we go along. While national governments and the United Nations system are still very much central to the activities of global governments, they only form 
a part of the overall picture of global governance. So in, in conclusion, let me say that the, during the interregnum, this interregnum, it gives us an opportunity now to reconceptualize what we mean by global governance, to think about ways in which we need to change the processes and institutions of governance, and also to allow us to have a normative position on global governance that will bring in those people who have been marginalized, who have been left out in the, process, in the past processes of creating uh, global governance. To me, this is the, the this this is a period of interregnum that will allow us to think about creating a new structure of global governance. At this juncture of transformation, the interregnum itself, the governance system of the globe is clearly bifurcated. The interstate system of governance is still with us, but we are observing the emergence of a multi-century system of diverse types of collectivities. Combined, we can label this summative global governance is a kind of governance that requires a subsidiarity principle uh, to guide its operations. It is, more, it is much more sophisticated and flexible than previous forms of governance, and it may provide a needed space and time for the traditional intergovernmental institutions to make the kinds of changes that are required for a more effective, efficient, and relevant global government system. So I'm going to end it there. So open up some, some questions and I try to answer some of your concerns uh, from this talk. Thank you very much.